Aloha biostatisticians. Welcome to the lab for correlation and regression. Today, we're going to talk about lemons. <laughs> lovely, lovely lemons. The first step for this lab is to go to your email where I sent you a zip folder with the R notebook file and the data file DF lemons. So if you go to your email, you'll, you'll see lab correlation and regression. Here's the attachment, download this attachment. And you'll see it shows up here in your downloads folder. Go to your downloads folder. And you'll see here the zipped folder. If you try to run the notebook from the zipped folder, it won't work properly. You have to unzip it. You have to unzip it, okay? So right click on the zipped folder, extract all. If your system works differently, if you have a different way of unzipping folders, you can use a different way of unzipping them, okay? I've also uploaded it to Laulima and you can download it from Laulima. But when you download the notebook from Laulima, remember it shows up as a text file. This file will be extracted to this folder. Just hit extract, great. Puts it in downloads. That's fine. Now from the unzipped folder, open correlation and regression lemons, which should open up in R. And this is what it looks like when it opens up, you see correlation and regressions, lemon example, author, a student, type your name here. It'll show up at the top of the report. And the date, today's date. Today is the 23rd of February, 2024. The automatic output is going to be an HTML document, which is fine. You can also submit it as a Word or PDF, but you will have to take a few extra steps. For PDF, you have to install LaTeX. Note that the text indented with this symbol indicates where you need to answer a question. Again, we're going to talk about lemons. Some lemons are bigger than others. I expect that the amount of juice inside the lemon is probably related to the size of the lemon. I want to know if the lemon size is directly related to lemon juice and if we can predict it. So the first thing we're going to do is a correlation analysis. Remember the correlation analysis gives us something slightly different than the regression analysis. Correlations tell us about the strength and direction of the relationship between two variables and that they are appropriate when we have two numeric variables that we think are linearly related. The null hypothesis for correlations is that there is no relationship or correlation between the two variables being studied. Down here, type in your question and hypotheses. Here we could type in the question simply, how are lemon length, which are the variables we collected, lemon length in millimeters and width also in millimeters correlated with millimeters correlated with lemon weight in grams. The null hypothesis, as I stated up here, is that there is no relationship or correlation between the two variables being studied. There is no correlation between lemon, here we'll put lemon size, and we mean both length 
and wit and lemon weight. The alternative hypothesis is always just the opposite of the null hypothesis. So here we can just say, we can copy and paste that null hypothesis here and in, say instead of there is no correlation, there is a correlation between lemon size, length, and width, and lemon weight. And then we collect the data. This was already done by the last class, so we don't have to do it. What we did was we measured the lemon length from tip to tip and the width along the widest point with calipers. And then to estimate juiciness, because it would be really messy to juice the lemons in the lab, we just weighed the whole lemon, assuming that most of the weight of the lemon comes from the juice. Now, of course, you could, you could test that. Hint, hint, someone who's looking for a project, you could actually measure the weight of the lemon and how much juice you get from the lemon and find out how well those two things are correlated. So we weighed our lemons to the nearest gram and measured their length and width to the nearest millimeter. And now we can go ahead and start on our analysis. The first step on our analysis is to load the libraries, read R, bplyr, and ggplot2, which I believe we've We've already installed, so they should load up pretty easily if you run this chunk. It works for me. I hope it works for you. If not, you'll see um, you'll see a yellow banner at the top when you open the notebook prompting you to install these packages. And if you're working within the unzipped folder that I sent you, your data file should already be in the same folder as the notebook. And this next chunk of code to load the data should work fine. But if it doesn't, I'll walk you through a couple steps to troubleshoot. So if I try to run this, it works just fine. <laughs> it works just fine. If it doesn't work, make sure you have unzipped the folder and that you're opening up the notebook from the unzipped folder. You might want to actually try shutting down and starting again if it's not working. Another thing you can do is to go up to session, to go up to session. And you see where it says set working directory. Choose to source file location. And what that does is it sets the working directory to the place where you have your, your R notebook. So it says, oh, I'm inside this folder. Oh, I'm inside this folder. What else is inside this folder? Oh, a data file is inside this folder. Try doing this. If that doesn't work, again, restart and try again. <laughs> it probably will. It probably will. To source file location, that would set it. Now, remember, if you set that and then you start working on another notebook, it wouldn't know where to look inside that folder because you told it, hey, look here. But automatically, when a notebook is opened from a folder, it looks inside that folder. It sets the working directory to that folder automatically, which is really handy. And one reason why I like to use notebooks. Assuming we got our data in, we see our data up here in the upper right-hand corner. We can see we have 20 observations of three variables, lemon length, lemon width, and lemon weight. And these are all numbers, which is great. That's what we want. We can even look at it by clicking on this name up here and it opens up in a little spreadsheet tab. We can see lemon length, lemon width, and lemon weight. Three variables, 20 observations. And we can come back over to the tab with our notebook. Notice that it's red here. When it's red, it means you've made some changes that are unsaved. It's a really good idea to save your changes really often. Just hit that little save button. Just click it like all the time, just every couple minutes. You don't want to lose anything and have to do it all again, right? Right. Next step. Clean the data. This is always a part of data analysis. In fact, it can be the most time consuming part of the data analysis is just cleaning and prepping the data. 
Here, we probably don't have much to do because I've already cleaned and prepped the data for you, but I've included the steps for you to have to use as a template when you're collecting data and if you want or need to clean and prep your data. The first thing that I included here is the subset data command. Again, we've already done this. The data has already been subsetted, but if you wanted to subset the data, you would just use the same code I would just copy and paste this code. Remember, if it's green, it's after the hashtag and it doesn't run. R does not recognize that as code to run. It's just a comment. You can say, okay, store in an object called data frame, a subset of the data from the data frame underscore lemons, lemon, from df underscore lemon, so look in df lemon and select variable one, variable two, and variable three. Of course, we don't have variable one, variable two, and variable three. What we have is lemon, lemon underscore length. So substitute lemon length for variable one. For variable two, substitute lemon width. And for variable three, substitute lemon wait. And if you run this, you've now created a new object in the upper right hand corner, you can see called df that has 20 observations of three variables, lemon length, lemon width, and lemon weight. It's essentially the same. So now you can use either one for the rest of the analysis. The next step is to summarize the data to find errors. This is really easy to do once you've subset it and cleaned the data. You just use this command here, summary df or summary df lemons would work too. And it brings us a tidy little summary of the data, lemon length with the minimum, the first quartile, the median, the mean, the third quartile and the maximum, right? So we can see our lemon length ranges from about 34 millimeters to 68 millimeters with a mean of 49. The lemon width ranged from 30 to 67 with a mean of 48. The lemon weight ranged from 15 to 146 with a mean of 67. Something else you might want to look at in these summaries is how different the median and the mode are from each other. So here the and under lemon length, the median is 51 and the mean is 49. That's pretty close. That would suggest that the data are not strongly skewed, right? If the median and the mean are the same, then it's perfectly normal. And if they're pretty close, it's probably not strongly skewed. Under lemon width, we see the median is 48.5 and the mean is 48.29. That's pretty close. That's suggesting the data are normally distributed. We'll look at some more graphs to test that. Under lemon weight, you can see the median is 65.86 and the mean is 67.82, which is a little bit more different, still not that much, not a big cause for concern. If it was like your median was 60 and your mean was 70, then you might think, oh, hmm. But again, that depends on the range of the data. The range of the data is 15 to 146. That's a pretty big range. We might actually have an outlier on one side or the other, but we'll see when we get to the histograms. Now, again, the next chunk of code is if needed. If needed to clean your data, you might need to do some things like omit NAs or change the data types. Remember, the correlation can only work with numeric data. It has to be numeric. So if R read it in as non-numeric data, which often happens if there's any missing values. If you have any blank cells in your data, R will often read that in as text. And then what you have to do is change everything to numeric, and then it'll automatically put NA in those blank cells. And then you have to go through and say, omit NAs and get rid of those blanks, right? And 
I've included the sample code here. I didn't include a chunk to do it because I know we don't need to do it for this data. But if you need to do this later for your data, here's a template for you to use. You just say NA omit is the function on your data frame and you store it in a data frame. Could be the same name or a different name or this function as numeric DF lemon is your data frame and store it either as the same data frame or a new data frame name. You can make a new data frame each step if you want to keep track of what you did. Sometimes I just keep it as the same name. Let's go ahead and save what we did since that was already a bunch. Save that. Now we can create some histograms to inspect the distribution of our data. We're going to use ggplot2 so we can make some nice looking histograms. This first chunk of code is going to make a histogram of lemon length. And here we then have the name of the data frame where ggplot is going to find the data to make the graph, right? You start by saying ggplot. OK, we know that we want to make a plot with ggplot. Here's the data frame name. OK, we know we want to use this data set to make the graph. Then we have this command aesthetic. And in the aesthetic command is where we list the x and y and categorical variables, however many variables we want to use. Here we just have an x. We just have an x for the histogram. And x is equal to lemon length. OK, so now we know we want to make a graph of lemon length that we found in the DF lemon data frame. Plus, let's give it some more information. What kind of a graph do we want? We want to make a histogram using the geome histogram that tells ggplot that's the kind of graph we want. And here we have this additional command called bin width, which says how wide are the bins to use for the histogram? In this case, it's 0 0.5. We also have fill blue. That's a nice color. And then the color here is black. That's going to be the color for, I think, the outline. Plus, plus the more information, labs. Those are labels. And if you hover over it, it actually gives you some information in yellow about how to use that command. The first label we want is the title. Let's call it lemon length histogram. And on the x axis, we want it to say, length. If we run this code, just this chunk here, or not the whole chunk, just this section of code, if you highlight it and then hit control enter, it runs it. And we see this histogram, lemon length histogram with the length on the x-axis and the count on the y-axis, because that's what the histogram does. It gives you the count, the number of times you get each value in these different bins or different ranges of data. OK, great. Now, if we do the same down here, we can actually just keep the cursor anywhere in this, in this data. Or you can select the whole thing. ggplot will give us a histogram of lemon width. And the final section of code will give us a histogram on lemon weight. I can minimize the console so we can see that better. This is the histogram of lemon weight. Now, these look a little bit funny, and I kind of did this on purpose because I wanted you to play around with the code. I wanted you to play around with the code by changing the bin width. I want you to think about that bin width of 0 0.5. Let's try changing it to, let's say, 1. How does that look? Make those bins a little bit bigger. That's a little bit better. How about if we changed it to two? That looks a little better, too. We can start to see the data a little bit more reasonably. Um, let's try, I think I tried five before, and that looked really nice. Yeah, that looks pretty good. You could also have three or four. You can play around with it to find something that looks good to you. I'll stick with five. I thought that looked pretty nice. I think that's a reasonable bin width for this range of data. We can try the same thing for lemon width. We can try 
changing our bin width to five. And now we see lemon width, the green histogram, bin width of five, that looks pretty reasonable. And then for lemon weight, let's try two. Ooh, no, I don't like that so much. Let's try uh, 20. Yeah, that's a bit better, might be hiding a bit. What about mm, like 15? That's pretty good too. 10? That's good. Yeah, that's good. I think that shows us pretty much the distribution of our data. Now, if we run the whole chunk at once by hitting the play button, we can see all the three graphs at once on these different panels and we can toggle back and forth in between them. So now let's inspect the histograms for normality. What do we think? It looks okay. It looks okay. It's not strongly skewed one way or the other. It's more or less normal. I think that'll be fine. Lemon width also looks approximately normal. And Lemon weight is a little bit more right skewed. We did have that one big lemon, but it's still approximately normal. I think it's fair enough to say that our data meet the assumptions. The next thing we can do is to make some box plots. Box plots are really, really easy in base R. If we use this template here in this chunk, I'm just gonna copy this code here and then paste it down below. I like to copy and paste it because I like to keep the unaltered code so I can use it as a template for the next time I want to make a box plot. And just remember it's box plot is the function and then you list the data frame and then you include the title. Main indicates the title. Title of my box plot. How about Lemon box plot. You run that and you can see you've got automatically three different box plots that show you the spread of the data. That's really, really handy, right? You didn't have to make three graphs, just one. And it allows you to compare the distributions of the data right next to each other. So you can see that lemon length looks pretty darn normal. The box plot is roughly symmetrical. The median is roughly in the, in the middle. The whiskers are about the same length on either side of the box. Lemon width is also pretty symmetrical. You've got an outlier on either side, but it's so generally symmetrical. I think that that's probably fine. Lemon weight does have that one big lemon, that larger outlier, but I wouldn't say this data is strongly skewed. I think it's more or less normal. We will have another lab where we'll look at some data that are really strongly skewed, and that's going to help you get a picture for how it looks when your data are super not normal and need to be transformed. Based on the box plots and histograms, how would you describe the distribution? This is for you to answer. You can say something like the histograms show that the data are approximately normally distributed with symmetrical distributions, oh, sorry, just symmetrical shapes, right? And then you can also say, the box plots support this conclusion showing only slight deviation from symmetrical with an outlier in lemon weight. You can type what you like, what you see, but Get used to looking at these and making conclusions about your data. 
Let's go ahead and save what we've done and move on to the next step, which is to make a scatter plot. Remember, the scatter plot is going to tell us a lot about our data. It's going to tell us about the form and the direction of the data. And here we are using the base plot function. We're not using ggplot, just the base plot function, which is plot x, y. Our x here is df lemon lemon length. Remember, you have to refer to the data frame and then dollar sign and then the variable name. That's our x. And our y is data frame dollar sign lemon weight comma, x label. Here's how we add the label. Lemon length in quotes, comma, y lab, y lab, lemon weight in quotes. And then main refers to the main title, which is scatter plot of lemon length versus lemon weight. Run this chunk to look at our scatter plot. There you go, very simple. Lemon length on the x-axis, lemon weight on the y-axis. Now remember with correlation, you're not making any kind of an assumption of a causal relationship. You could flip these axes and the correlation is gonna be the same. So what do we know just by looking at the scatter plot? Well, first of all, we can see that it's a positive relationship. It's a positive relationship. It goes up and to the right. As lemon length increases, so does lemon weight. We can also see that it looks pretty linear. We're not seeing any strong curves or anything like that going on. It looks like a, a linear positive relationship. You can also see that if you kind of imagine a, a line going through these points, it would be pretty close to fitting in the middle of all the points. So it's probably a strong relationship, but we can't really tell that until we get our correlation coefficient. For now, what we can say about the form, how would you describe the form of the relationship between lemon length and lemon weight? We could say the form of the relationship between lemon length and lemon weight is positive and linear, All right? Oh, that's not just the form that, sorry, the form is linear, the direction is positive. But might as well put that in since we can see it on the graph. Now we'll do the same thing for lemon width and lemon weight. Remember we have two size variables. The easy way to do that is just to take this code from the chunk above the scatter plot, copy it, and paste it down into the chunk below. Then we'll just change the variable names. Instead of lemon length, we're going to put in lemon width. And I'm just going to copy this word width so I don't have to type it and select length, add width. And we still want to have lemon weight as the y axis, so we don't change that. The X label instead of lemon length will be lemon width. Capitalize the W. And the main title instead of scatter plot of lemon length versus lemon weight will be scatter plot of lemon width versus lemon weight. So now we just change the titles, we change the label, and we change what's going on the axes. When we run this, now we've got scatter plot of lemon width versus lemon weight. You know what? I, I forgot to do something. Mm, mm, mm. Oops, oops, oops. Lemon length was measured in millimeters. Gotta get those units in there. Lemon weight was measured in grams. Let's run that again so we have our units. Good. Okay. And this one is wrong too. We forgot to put the units there. Okay, let's make sure we add the units. Lemon width in millimeters, lemon weight in grams. Run that again. Okay, we got our units. 
very important. Now, how would we describe the form of the relationship between lemon width and lemon weight? Well, strictly speaking, we can say the form of the relationship between lemon width and lemon weight is linear. The direction is positive. Right? You can see we have a linear positive relationship. Let's save that. That was a lot of work we don't want to lose. The next step is to calculate the correlation coefficient, which is really simple to do in R. We just use the core function, COR function. The core function computes the correlation coefficient between pairs of numeric variables in a data frame or matrix. Remember, the inputs must be numeric. First, we'll do a Pearson correlation. This is the default method for the core function, so we don't have to specify it. If we want a different kind of correlation coefficient, we specify it, which we'll do down below. So to calculate the correlation between lemon length and lemon weight, we use this code template. I will copy it and paste it below. So we'll use the core function df is the name of the data frame, dollar sign, variable one. What's variable one? In this case, it's lemon length. Well, nice that it comes up for you. Just select that. Variable two is df lemon weight. Right? If you try to run, if you try to run just this code by itself, it won't work. Right? If you try to run df variable one, variable two, what does it say? Error. It doesn't find it because it doesn't exist. There is no variable one in the df. There is no variable two in the df. So you have to supply it with the actual names of the variables. df, lemon length, df, lemon weight. Now, running that, we get this one little number right here. That is our Pearson's correlation coefficient. Nice, right? It's so easy. And our correlation coefficient is 0 0.9313699. If we round that, that's 0 0.93. That's a very strong correlation co coefficient. Remember that the correlation coefficient ranges from negative 1 to 1. A perfect correlation is 1. So a correlation of 0 0.93 indicates a very strong positive relationship between the two variables. Now let's go down and do the same thing for lemon width and lemon weight. Again, if you copy this code, paste it below, and substitute the variable names for variable one, here we want to say lemon width. And for variable two, we substitute lemon weight. Run that code, and we get 0 0.96, again, indicating a very strong positive relationship. If it was a negative number, that would be a negative relationship. A positive number gives you a positive relationship. We could also see that from the scatter plot, that it was a positive relationship. Now, what if we wanted to calculate the correlation coefficient for all three variables at once, which is actually how we mostly use the correlation coefficients. When we want to look at a lot of variables all at once, you put them all in a data frame, make sure it's all numeric, and then run this core function on the entire data frame. So in this case, you actually can take this code for df and run it just as is. And what you get here is a little matrix with lemon length, lemon width, and lemon weight labels for the rows, for the columns, and then lemon length, lemon width, and lemon weight labels for the, the rows. And what we have here along the diagonal, you see it's a one. 
That's the correlation between lemon length and lemon length. And here we have a one again. That's the correlation between lemon width and lemon width. And what do you think is the correlation between lemon weight and lemon weight? It's one, right? So this matrix basically, it repeats itself and it does a correlation of these two variables. What we mostly want to look at here is a relationship between lemon weight and lemon length and lemon width. So we could just look here at this last column, lemon weight, and then say, okay, the correlation between lemon length and lemon weight is right here, 0 0.93. Right, that's the same number we got up here. And the correlation between lemon weight and lemon width is right here, 0 0.964, right? That's the same number we got up here. These are the two numbers that we already got. It also gives us something else we haven't looked at yet, which is the correlation between lemon length and lemon width, which is right here, 0 0.92. Also, if you look at lemon length versus lemon width, you can look at it this way. And notice that these values also these values also repeat down here. You could look at it this way: lemon length and lemon weight, lemon weight and lemon width. Right? The values repeat. So really, of all this table, you really just want these these two numbers. You see how that works? You just scroll up and down and over. That's what you want. Based on these Pearson correlation coefficients, what can we conclude about the strength and direction of the relationships among the three variables? Well, you can say the Pearson's correlation coefficients tell us that the relationships among lemon length and lemon weight are strong and positive. And you could just go ahead and put your correlation coefficient in here, right? P equals lemon length and lemon weight, I would round that to like two, right? And that the correlation between lemon width and lemon weight is strong and positive. And again, we can put our P, our Pearson's. It should be rho, but um, I can't put that in there. And then it's 0 0.96 equals 0 0.96. Actually, it is P. That's right. Don't get con this is not the P value. This is not the the P value of probability. This is our Pearson's correlation coefficient. Don't get confused. Okay. So now we know that our relationships are strong and positive, which is a good thing. That's what we want in a relationship, right? Let's save that. Now we can calculate Spearman's rank correlations. This is a non-parametric correlation that's based on ranks. So it doesn't assume that your data are normally distributed. It's really, really handy if your data are not normally distributed and you can't transform them to be normally distributed. And the code is really simple. It's almost exactly the same. So if we come down here to this chunk, we can see that the code is simply correlation variable one and variable two. And then all you do is you specify method equals Spearman. So if we copy and paste this code down here below, we just have to change variable one to lemon length and variable two to lemon weight. 
method equals Spearman, what do we get? We get 0 0.89, still very strong and positive. Now we want to code the Spearman correlation between lemon width and lemon weight. Again, put the code below and substitute variable one. You put in lemon width. And for variable two, again, you put lemon weight. Run that code and our Spearman's correlation coefficient is 0 0.94. Notice that these are a little bit lower than the Pearson's, not as strong as a test. Now, how do you think we would do it to run the correlations on all the variables at once for Spearman's instead of Pearson's? And think about it. To run the correlation for all the variables at once for Pearson's, it was just core DF. What if it was so simple that all we had to do was say core DF, and then just like when we are running one or when we run two variables at a time, we just have to add this comma method equals Spearman. Comma method equals Spearman. Core df method equals Spearman. We run that and we get our correlation coefficients for all three variables at once. Again, you can either look over here under the lemon weight column to see the correlation coefficient for lemon weight and length, lemon weight and width, or you can go over here to the row of lemon weight and see the correlation of weight and length and width and length. They're the same. They're the same because it doesn't matter which is X and which is Y. You can flip the axes with correlation. Not the same for regression, but for correlation, either one works. How does the Spearman correlation differ from the Pearson's correlation? Does it change our conclusion about the strength and the direction of the relationship? Hmm. Well, we can say the Spearman correlation coefficients were a little lower than the Pearson's correlation coefficients, but they do not change our conclusions, right? They're still strong and positive. They do not change our conclusions about the relationships. They are still strong and positive. Okay, great. Which one gives us the better correlation? We got the better correlation from Pearson's, right? The Pearson's correlation coefficient. It was stronger. And since our data are normal, we get to use it. Let's save that and come down here to transformations. Now we don't actually need to calculate the transformations for these variables because our data are normal, but here I've given you the code if you wanted to do it and you could look at it. It won't change anything very much. I'll just show you real quick what it would look like though. I'm gonna copy this one, this line of code and paste it below without the hashtag and change variable one to lemon length. And again, I'll change variable one to lemon length, lemon length. And what this does is it says for every, for every lemon length in the data frame, calculate the log 10 and store it into a new variable called log lemon length inside that same data frame. So we're adding a new column to our data frame by doing this, okay? We're not gonna overwrite anything, we're gonna add something. And right now, if you look in the upper right-hand corner, you see we've got 20 observations of three variables in our data frame. After we run this code, watch what happens. Look at that, now we have 20 observations of four variables. We just created a new variable in our data frame. 
Now we have log lemon length, right? If you click here, you see the spreadsheet. We have log lemon length. Go back over to our notebook tab, and let's do the same thing for log lemon width. So copy and paste this code below. And again, you want to change the name of the variable twice here. Take out variable two, where it says bar two, and type in lemon width. And again, where it says variable two, I just highlight it and type over lemon underscore width. Oops, I have a typo here. <laughs> I got an error because I put lemong with <laughs> lem. I don't know how a G got in there. <laughs> yeah, if you make a typo, it won't work. But this time I got it right. And now we have five variables. Let's do the same thing for lemon weight. So instead of variable three, we're going to say lemon weight, log lemon weight, and lemon weight. weight. So now we have created three new variables. We've created three new variables, log lemon length, log lemon width, and log lemon weight. You can see they're really different. They're really different. Log transforming makes them very different. Let's see what it looks like when we run the Pearson correlation coefficient and plot them. I'm going to actually change this to just run the correlation on all the variables. So I'm just going to do core df so we can look at it all at once. And now you see we've got correlation coefficients for all the variables. And you can see that log lemon Wait, let's just look at this last chunk over here. Let's look at this last column over here. If we look at the correlation of log lemon weight on the unlogged length, it's 0 0.925. On the un unlogged width, it's 0 0.96. And on weight on itself, it's 0 0.94. Remember, this is log weight and then unlogged weight. And then if you look at the log log correlation, you get 0 0.93. And for lemon weight and lemon width, you get 0 0.97. So does it improve our correlation coefficient to log transform the variables? Well, let's see. It was lemon length by lemon weight was 0 0.93. Log lemon weight by log lemon weight was 0 0.93. Four. Tiny bit, not really worth it. <laughs> and then what about, so lemon weight and lemon width was 0 0.96. Log lemon width, weight and log lemon width, 0 0.97. Slightly higher. Log transforming them makes them fit just a bit better, but really not very much. Now, if we want to create scatter plots of these log transformed variables, we're going to have to make a few different plots, right? First, copy and paste this code below and change our variable name. Instead of log variable one, let's change it to log lemon length and log lemon weight oh we have to refer to the variables right data frame dollar sign data frame dollar sign now we can see our plots look kind of similar to our untransformed variables the fit is a little bit better because the correlation coefficient does go up a tiny bit, but it looks about the same, right? So transforming the variables just scales them differently. And if they're already normally distributed, the 
not going to change that much. But again, I'll show you another notebook where we'll use some really skewed data and we'll be able to see what it looks like when you log transform and it, when it really is necessary. I'll make a separate video for that. Now let's try writing the code for log lemon length and width. I'm just going to copy and paste this code from here and put it below. And all I'm going to do is change this word length to width. Right now I've got lemon width on the x-axis and lemon weight on the y-axis. And again, we can see that that's a very nice, that's a very nice fit. <laughs> it is a really very nice fit. A very linear relationship. That's wonderful. If we go down, we can answer this question. How has the form direction and strength of the relationship changed with the log transformed variables? Now, has the form changed? No, it's still linear. Has the direction changed? No, it's still positive. Has the strength changed a tiny bit stronger? Not a lot, a couple points. So the form, direction, and strength of the relationship have changed only a little with slightly stronger correlation correlations for the log transformed variables. You could state it somewhat differently. You could answer this question a little differently. This is just how I decided to answer it right now. Let's go ahead and save that. We did a lot of work. We want to hold on to it. What's next? Conclusions and further questions. Wow, we're almost at the end of the correlation part. Great. What can we conclude overall about the relationship between lemon length, width, and weight? Overall, what can we say? We can say that there is a strong linear relationship between these three variables. And if you were writing a scientific paper, you would probably then put your correlation coefficients in a little table and refer to it as table one. What additional questions might we ask about lemons? I will leave this up to you to think about what else you could ask about lemons based on these data or taking additional data. Just be creative, come up with something. Save that. On to part two regressions. This is where it gets really interesting. I hope it's been interesting this whole time, but now we get some really good stuff here. Write out our question and statistical hypotheses. Now, remember for regression, we can do more than just look at the strength and direction of the relationship. We can also find out what proportion of the variance in Y is explained by X. We get that from the R squared, and we can predict the value of y for any value of x within the range because we have the slope equation, right? So now we can do some prediction as well as quantify how much variation of in y is explained by x, which is really neat. So the question we could ask here is how much very, or how, let's say like this, how well Can we predict lemon weight from lemon size? Again, size as length and width. Right? How well can we predict them? Let's try to do that. Our null hypothesis, our null hypothesis that was really similar, we say there is no relationship between lemon size and weight. Lemon size, again, length and width. The more specific you are in your hypotheses, the better it will be for you when you go to write your conclusions and do your analyses. So like spending a minute to figure out how to word it is usually helpful. I'm just 
kind of going through pretty fast for this simple example. The null hypothesis, there is no relationship between lemon size, length and width and weight. And if you just copy and paste that, just make life easy, say, okay, what's the opposite? What's our alternative hypothesis? There is a relationship. Just change that no to an A. Yeah, there is a relationship between lemon size and weight. That's the alternative. There is a relationship. The B is something. The beta is something. It's not zero. Now we need to check our assumptions for the regression analysis. Remember our assumptions for the re linear regression? We assume that the data were collected with appropriate randomization, independence, and minimal error by our top-notch research team, in other words, the last class. So here are the assumptions we check with the data. Normal distribution of Ys, linear relationship between X and Y, and constant distribution of residuals. And by constant, we mean that it should not be increasing with or decreasing with increasing values of X. It should be constant along the x-axis and it also should be normally distributed we shouldn't have like a lot of big errors in on uh, like a lot of big errors in the extreme sides of of x i'll show you what that means so normality we did that in the last section right we can say the y is were normally distributed no problem pretty close right I mean, log transforming made it a little bit better correlation. So I guess there was some skew that could be corrected for, but again, the relationship was pretty strong and very strongly linear. Okay, again, linear relationship. Yes, we already checked that. So this time we can add an extra step and add a least squares regression line, as well as get an R squared, which tells us how much of the variance in Y is predicted by X. And we can check the assumption of linearity by running the linear model and looking at the results. The function for running the linear model is LM, which means linear model, linear model, linear regression model. And it's written with the response variable first, followed by the tilde, then the predictor Y. So the form is LM Y as a function of X. This is the form of the equation. Or you can read it as y is modeled as a function of x. So to run a model with x1 as length, as a predictor of y weight, and store the results of the model in a new object called LM1, short for linear model one. We'll come down to this chunk, and again, I'll just copy and paste this code without the hashtag just below it and say, okay, LM1 is going to be Y as a function of X. Again, our Y here is going to be in our data frame, dollar sign, lemon length. Oops, no, that's wrong. Lemon weight, that's what's on the Y axis. Y goes first, it's switched, right? Lemon weight. And our x, the predictor variable, is df dollar sign lemon length. This is our first variable. We run that and we find that we've created a new object over here in the upper right hand corner, which is the linear model, which contains coefficients, residuals, effects, ranks, fitted values, all kinds of good stuff right? The model, all that stuff. It's a, a whole bunch of things are stored in that LM1 object. Now let's run a second model with width as the predictor and weight as the Y and store the results as a new object called LM2, short for linear model two. So again, let's just copy and paste this code without the hashtag. And we can run LM on our Y, which again is DF dollar sign lemon weight. And our X is DF dollar sign lemon width. Run that. Oh, I didn't get the value in there. Lemon 
weight. There we go. Okay. DF dollar sign lemon weight, DF dollar sign lemon width, run this, and it stores the results of, of the model in an object called LM2. We come up here, minimize LM1. We can see now we've created LM2, which is a list of 12 objects. It's a list. It's a different type of object than what we've been working with before, except as the results. Okay. Let's save that. Good. Good job. Now let's check out the scatter plots with the least squares line for our x as a function, or y as a function of x1, weight versus length. Now note you have to run the whole thing at once for it to work. If you do one at a time, it doesn't work. So I'm going to copy and paste this code below and then just get rid of the hashtag so it'll run and plot x as a function of y1. And you know, just because I get tired of typing, I'm actually just going to take, I'm going to go up to LM1, this LM1 chunk, and take df lemon weight as a function of df lemon length. I'm going to copy, and I'm just going to paste that down in here because it's the same thing, right? And then abline LM1, it's going to take that linear model that we just created and look in the results of the linear model to predict where that line should be, okay? Now we're going to run that whole chunk and now we get our scatter plot with a regression line. Neat, right? A, B line is make a line from A to B using the results of the linear model. If we just use plot, we just get the same scatter plot that we got before. But when we add the, the line, yeah, it doesn't work <laughs> unless you do it all at once. Run the whole chunk. There you go. Now we have the regression line. Cool. How can we describe the form of the relationship between length and weight? Is it linear? Yes. Yes. The relationship between length and weight is linear Great. Now let's repeat the code for lemon weight versus width. It's the same thing to plot the data. Here, I'm just going to go up above the scatter plot, copy this code, paste it down below, but I'm going to change where it says length. I'm going to change that to width. And then where it says abline LM1, I'm going to change that to 2. I'm going to add the regression line for linear model 2 because that was the one where we did the regression on width, right? Now, if I run this whole chunk, I get my linear model for lemon width and lemon weight. And you can see that line fits the data really well. Those points are too far from the line for both of them. The points fall pretty close to the line. Okay. They fall pretty close to the line. We have strong linear relationships. So again, we can say, yes, we have strong, here, let's see, we have, strong, positive, linear relationships for these variables. That's not very well said. I should do that better. <laughs> I'm getting tired. <laughs> OK, we can say um, the relationship between lemon width and lemon weight is strong, positive, and linear. There we go. That's a better way to put it. Homoscedasticity. So this is a $5 word that 
basically is saying, are our variances normally distributed? Are they equal? Are they constant? Do they change very much for the values of X? Like if you saw a real, like a strong leverage point, like if this point, you see, it's, it's a bit further from the line. This point is a bit further from the line than these three points. But then again, there's a point down here that's also a bit further from the line. And this, yeah, there's not, there's not like a pattern where sometimes it happens. Sometimes it happens when you're collecting data that on the extreme ends of your X, you get a lot of variation, like way more variation than you do in either the middle or, you know, sometimes the lower, sometimes the lower end is where you see the variation sometimes the upper end. And sometimes that's because you have fewer values at the ends. That's also the case here. We had one really big one, one pretty small one. And that can result in just by chance some really extreme values of Y at that value of X. And then you start to see these really wonky non-constant variances. And there's a way to check for that and that's what we'll do here. We're going to make diagnostic plots. So these diagnostic plots help us to check for constant variances by actually making graphs of the residuals using the results that we stored in that LM1 object. So if we come down to this chunk here, this par MF row two by two, what this does, is it sets the plot window to show four panels at once. It's just like telling R, I just want to see all my graphs at one time instead of one at a time. And then this plot, LM1, it basically plots the results of the linear model. And what we're going to do is we're going to get four little plots that show residuals and fitted and check for outliers. And then this par MF row C11 is basically just setting it back to normal for the how many plots you see at a time. You run this whole chunk at once. You see now we've got these four plots all at once. And this is what you get when you plot LM. First, you get residuals versus fitted. I know this is all brand new. It's like, whoa, what is that? Oh, my God. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> it is. And it's not really that easy to interpret these. But with practice, you'll get the idea. So just stick with me, all right? Check this out. What we have here on our x-axis are the fitted values. That means those are the predicted values, right? If we were going to plug in every x into our linear regression equation, y equals mx plus b for every x, then we are going to have our, that's what makes our, our line, right? Now let's take those fitted values and put them on the X axis. And then the residuals, remember the residuals are the distance from that predicted point to the actual point. It's, it's a subtracting those two, right? That distance, that difference, those are the residuals. So now we're gonna say, well, let's plot what we expect that point on that line to be on the X axis and on the Y axis where how much difference it is from that predicted point, right? That's our residuals versus fitted plot. So think about this. If the residuals, if the difference between the expected and, and actual point was really high, then you would have a really high value of residual. So like, look, 11 here, 11 has a pretty high residual value. It falls further from the line than a lot of the other values. Also, four falls kind of far from the line. One falls kind of far from the line. If they were, if they all had exactly the same distance from the predicted line, then what you would have here on this red line is be like totally flat, fully flat. But that that, that just doesn't ever happen, right? <laughs> you know, it's always all over the place. But what you don't want is like I showed you in the lecture. You don't want this line to be like a strong smile. I know it is a smile. It's not flat, but Trust me, this isn't too bad. When you start looking at a lot of data, you'll see that it can get a lot worse than this. This is close enough. This is okay. Mostly when you look at all these points, you see kind of a random scatter. You don't see like a strong pattern that there's really high residuals um, at one end of the X or the other. So it's okay.
And then we have our QQ residuals. Now remember the QQ plots that we used before were to check to see how, whether or not our data were normally distributed. So now we're not checking to see if our data are normally distributed, we're checking to see if our residuals are normally distributed. Right? We want to normally distributed residuals. We want to have some small residuals, some big residuals, but most of them in the middle. Most of those residuals somewhere in the middle, right? Just like our normal plots. And so here, if the points fall along the line, we can say that they do fit the expectations of a normal distribution. And we can see that here we have the theoretical quantiles and the standardized residuals. So the standardized residuals are just um, standardized. I think you just divide by the standard deviation. And some of the points fall off the line, but pretty close. They fall pretty close to the line, so that's okay. And what about our scale location? I won't get into that. It's pretty similar to what we found for, it's pretty much like the residuals versus fitted, except it's standardized residuals, the square, the square root of standardized residuals. That gives us roughly the same information. But this fourth plot here, the residuals versus leverage, remember when we talked in the lecture about outliers and leverage and how outliers could be a problem for your regression if they lever that line up or down if they have strong leverage. So do your points have strong leverage? Well, this nice plot actually tells you that. And it does it by calculating something called the Cook's distance. The Cook's distance, if it's more than 0 0.5, then it's a little bit iffy. If it's more than one, that's outside the second row of gray dashed lines, then that could be a real problem point. That's a strong outlier. You know what? I'm going to make me a little bit bigger here. Yeah. Hey. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Great. Now we do have one point that falls right along that dash line, point number four, which I think is that, that big lemon, that really big lemon. And it is a little bit of an outlier. It does have a little bit of leverage, not surprising. Look, it's way over here. It's all the way on the end and it's higher than the rest of the points. So it seems like it's, probably pulling that regression line up. If we removed it, our slope might be a little flatter. Which tends to suggest that you get more weight than expected for the size for the bigger lemons, like it's really good value to buy the bigger lemons because they sell them by the each, right? Just thinking about it. And they're expensive. Those lemons are expensive. I got these ones from my friend's tree though, so they were free. Okay, so we've got we've got a little bit of leverage here in the residuals versus leverage. The cook distance is 0 0.5, which is moderately high, but not too much to worry about. Not too much to worry about. I think we'll be okay. So how does the residual versus fitted plot look? Do you see any sign that the difference between the actual values and predicted values gets bigger as X increases? That would look like a fan shape. That's what we don't want. So how does the residuals versus fitted plot look? Um, the residual versus fitted plot um, suggests that the residuals are um, relatively um, randomly distributed. With we see with no with no strong pattern indicating increasing. Um, residual values with increasing fitted values so that they're they're relatively constant they're relatively constant right the residual values are relatively constant 
throughout the range of x. It's OK. Now let's repeat this process for our x2, which is our lemon width. And I've already written the code for you. You just have to run it. Again, you get the residuals versus fitted. Again, you get kind of the same pattern. So like in the middle of the data, you get some like lower residuals. And in the upper parts of the data, you get some higher residuals. It's like a little bit of a smile. That's not great, but it's really, it's not too bad. Um, again, the QQ residuals fall more or less along the line. That's acceptable. Um, and the residuals versus leverage. Now we really do see over here that that point 0.4 has got some pretty strong leverage. It's got some pretty strong leverage with the width, even more so with the length. That could be a cause for concern. It could be a cause for concern. But yeah, let's go ahead and run with it and see what we get. So based on our plots, can we see that the data meet the assumption for linear regression analysis? And I would say yes. Yes, based on the diagnostic plots, which include the histograms we did before. Those are part of the diagnostic plots. Our data meet the assumptions for linear regression. And, you know, if this was an actual um, experiment that you were doing, you might want to go out and just collect some more big lemons. Like, go get some, go get some more really big ones at that extreme end and some more really small ones at the other extreme ends. And that's probably going to end up balancing out those variances. It often happens when you only have like one big one. You're like, wait, but that, that variance is like all over the place. Or it could just be that there really is something going on with big lemons. You just have one, so it's hard to say. Now let's print the results of the linear model. So running this code here, summary LM1, that's how you actually get to see the results of the model. If you just... Let's see if I select LM1 and I just run that, you, you get this. Like, that's not what you want to know. What you want to know is this, right? This is what you want to know. It starts by saying call. This is the, the formula. This is what you told it to do. Good. <laughs> that's what you told it to do. DF lemon weight as a function of DF lemon length. Our residuals here. Now, some people don't get this section of the output. You don't get the... Um, the, the summary statistics, uh, the five number summary for the residuals. But I do, I think it's really handy to look at it and you can kind of see whether or not your residuals look more or less normally distributed this way too. Okay, our min and our max. Okay, so we've got, yeah, uh, not entirely symmetrical distribution of residuals, but not too bad. But here's what we really want to see. We want to see this section down here. This is, this is what you want to pay attention to right now. So look at this here. The estimate of the intercept and what you have here is the slope. This is the slope. So this is the intercept and this is the slope. This is how you get the regression equation. All right, here we have the coefficients. The estimate of the intercept is negative 101 and the estimate of the slope for df lemon length is 3.408 here's your intercept here's your slope here's your intercept and here's your slope this is what you need to write the regression equation right the linear model you also get a standard error of the intercept and a standard error of the slope, a T value for the intercept, which usually doesn't matter that much. That's usually not something we're interested in, but there's a T value for the slope, which is what allows us to say whether or not there's a significant slope. And here we have a P value for the intercept, a P value for the slope. And we do wanna know, oh, look, our T value for the slope is 10. 
So that's relatively high, which means our p-value is really small. This is a significant relationship. Hmm. S significant codes, you can take a look at this. These three stars indicate a very small p-value. And then we look at the residual standard error and the multiple R squared, adjusted R squares, and we also get F statistic, degrees of freedom, and the p-value. Now, when you only have a simple linear regression, only one X on your Y, you can just use the t-value and the p-value, but as we get into doing multiple linear regressions, we're going to have multiple variables, and we'll want to look at the F statistic and the p-value for the overall regression. And there's this multiple R squared. Again, this is for when we have multiple X's predicting our Y's. And here's the adjusted R squared. You can most of the time use either one. Let's just look at the adjusted R squared for this exercise. So what's the intercept? I want you to type this in because I want you, I want to be sure that you know where to find it when you look at this output. The intercept is negative 101. That's enough. What is the slope? 3.4, right? Intercept, negative 101, slope 3.4. What is the adjusted R value? The adjusted R squared value is 0 0.86. Again, this means that about 86% of the variation in lemon weight can be accounted for by lemon length. Good. Okay, what's the F statistic? It is 117.8. And the p-value is, let's just say, less than 0 0.001. You can put three zeros in here if you want to. <laughs> Two is enough. Based on this output, what can we say about the relationship for lemon weight versus length? Well, we can say that, first of all, there is a significant positive. How do you know it's positive? Besides looking at the graphs, we can see the slope is a positive number, right? Significant positive, let's say, a, is a, a strong significant positive relationship between lemon length and lemon weight with, what is it again? 86% of the variation in lemon weight explained by lemon length in millimeters, right? millimeters, grams, variation, lemon weight in grams, the units in there. All right. All right, so we can say there's a strong, significant, positive relationship with 86% of the variation in lemon weight explained by lemon length. And then what we can do is we can actually use our supporting evidence from the output to say our R squared value is equal to 0 0.86. Our, let's say F value is equal to 117. And our P value is less than 0 0.0001. Right? You put that at the end of the sentence. So the person who's reading your sentence can say, oh, that's how they got that conclusion. 
How do we know that it's a strong, significant, positive relationship and all this? Well, actually, we don't know the um, the positive because we didn't put the slope in here. But we can say it's strong. An R squared of 0 0.86 is a really, really strong relationship. And that is significant. There's our p-value. What else can we say? Well, we, we can say more, right? We can say for every one millimeter increase in lemon length, right? We have a predictive relationship for every one millimeter increase in lemon length, lemon weight increases by how much? 3.4 grams. Right? And that's our slope equation. We can say lemon weight in grams is equal to 101 plus 3.408 times lemon length. There's our regression equation. So that would be a nice complete answer. There is a strong, significant, positive relationship between lemon length and lemon weight with 86% of the variation in lemon weight explained by lemon length, R squared equals 0 0.86, F equals 117, P less than 0 0.0001. For every one millimeter increase in lemon length, lemon weight increases by 3.4 grams. And there's our equation. Nice, right? Now let's do the same thing for the regression on lemon weight and width. All we have to do to print the results is use this command summary LM2. Remember, that was our second regression model. Oops. And you have to spell summary with an A, apparently. <laughs> Here we get very much the same thing. Again, the call is the formula. That's what we told it to do. Make sure that's right. Oh, yep, yeah, that's what we told it to do. Lemon weight as a function of lemon width. Our residual five number summary, you can see that the minimum is negative 19, the maximum is 15, which looks pretty symmetrical to me. And again, we get the coefficients down here. So our estimated intercept is 0 0.94. Okay, now you think about this for a second, though. It's probably not right to say that. Okay, so the, the intercept is the value of lemon weight when lemon width is zero, right? It's a value of y when x is zero. So it's a value of lemon weight when length length or width is zero. Does that make sense that it would be a negative value? Like, can you have a negative weight for lemons? No, you can't. There's no such thing as a negative lemon weight. If the length or the width of the lemon is zero, what would be the weight? it would be zero, right? So there is a way to force this regression line through zero so that the intercept is zero when it makes logical sense that it must be zero. But we're not going to do that here today. I'm just going to let you, you know, play with this as it is. Just know there is a way to do that because logically it doesn't make sense to have a negative, a negative weight for something in real life, right? At least not um, not for lemons. What would negative lemon? I can't imagine. And the slope is 3.3522, right? So for every one millimeter increase in lemon width, we get a 3.35 increase in lemon weight. Cool, right? And here's the standard error for 
the estimate, we could actually say we, oh yeah, we could put that in our results here too. Actually, we could put um, for every one millimeter increase in lemon length, lemon weight increases by 3.4 grams. Yeah, we could put that here too. Plus, plus or minus um, 0 0.314 standard deviation, right? You can include that. Then you know, oh, that's like a pretty good estimate. Like that's pretty close. It's not that much variation around that, that estimate. Remember, this the slope is the mean change. So it's a, it's a mean, you get a standard deviation. All right, down here with the lemon width, I want you to type in what is the intercept. The intercept is negative 0.94. Oh, no, sorry. It's negative 94. What is the slope? The slope is 3.35. What is the adjusted R squared? The adjusted R squared down here is 0 0.9255, even stronger for width than it was for length. What is the F stat? The F statistic is down here on the bottom line. It's 237.2, 237.2, or you can round it. What is the P value? Again, the P value for the overall regression here is exactly the same as the P value for the slope coefficient of the x variable because we only have one. If we had more, then the p-value here and the p-value here would be different if we had multiple x's. But because we have one, they're all the same, simple linear regression. And so we say the p-value is less than 0 0.0001. OK, based on this output, what can we say about the relationship for y and x? Well. What did we say here? What did we say here? Use this as a template to write out your results. Use this as a template to write out your results here. OK, pay attention to this. Really important that you understand how to state the conclusions and cite the evidence from the output. Control S. <laughs> Save that. That was a lot of work. What do we have to do next? Oh, we have to graph our data. We have to make a scatter plot with ggplot2. Let's do it with ggplot so it looks really nice. Here's the code. I gave it all to you. I gave it all to you. It's just geom point. Wait, did I give it all to you? Is this all going to work? Oh, something's not going to work. Right. You got to take out this hashtag. Check out that hashtag. And then it says plot. So we're going to store the results of this whole plot, ggplot function in an object called plot. We don't always do this. We don't always store it as a thing. But in this case, we will because we want to play with it later on and add layers onto it, like building up a layer cake. So the ggplot function, first, we tell it what data to look at here, data frame or df underscore lemon would also work. The aesthetic, we tell it our x is equal to x1. Oh, no, wait, that doesn't work. We have to put in the right number. OK, what's our x1? Oh, yeah, our x1 is lemon length. And if you type it in right, it'll work. If you type it in wrong, it won't. And what's our y? What's our y here? Uh, lemon weight. Lemon underscore weight. OK, that is so that's our x is lemon length. Our y is lemon weight. You got to keep that straight. It's not like correlation. What's the predictor variable is the x. What's being predicted is the y. We're predicting weight from length. Geom point, we want to have the points on there. That's going to give us the scatter plot of the data points. And then geom smooth. Using the method LM linear model, using this formula, y is a function of x, and we already told it what our x and y's are. Standard error, in this case, false. You could include it. Color equals red to add a red regression line. Then we're going to add labels. On the x, we're going to have length in millimeter. This time I remembered to put the units, which you should always, always, always do. And the weight, 
in grams. Those are the labels for the axes. And then GG title gives the title for the whole plot, scatter plot with linear regression, theme, minimal. Otherwise, you get the kind of um, grade background that is the default for GG plot. I like the theme minimal. I think it looks cleaner. And if we run all this, select all this and run it, what we get is a nice, well, actually, we don't get the plot yet. We have to say print plot. Let me see. There we go. The scatter plot with linear regression. Length, weight, scatter plot with linear regression. We get the nice regression line. But we want to do a little bit more, a little bit more, and that's to add the intercept slope and adjusted R squared from the results to the subtitle so it appears on the graph. Wouldn't that be handy to be able to look at the graph and get all the information all at once, right? So let's say, take this plot. Remember, we stored our graph in an object called plot. So then we can add to the plot, take that plot, add to it labels, a subtitle using the paste command, slope, which will be the coefficient of the linear model one rounded to two significant digits, intercept, and the R squared. Let's see if this all works. If this all works, and then we print the plot, then what we should have is, yes, something like this. We should have a scatter plot with linear regression that gives us our slope, our intercept, and our R squared. So we can write the regression equation. We can make a prediction. We can say, well, how I just bought a lemon that was 50 millimeters. It was right here. Oh, no, that's, sorry, that's 50, 55, 60. It was 65 millimeters. It's right here. How much should it weigh <laughs> if this regression equation holds, right? This is a nice graph. You can take that graph and you can put it in a publication. A little bit of adjusting, but pretty close. Now you can repeat the same process to make a graph for width and weight. Be sure to change your axis labels and units and refer to linear model two, not linear model one. So let's do that. Let's just take all this stuff here and let's just copy it. And let's just paste it right down here, right? Let's just paste it right down here. And now instead of with, wait a minute. Yeah, that was length. Okay, now we're going to go and do width. Okay, so everywhere it says length, you're going to change that word to width. And let's call it plot two. Let's call this plot two so it doesn't overwrite our plot one. Plot two, ggplot, data, data frame, aesthetic, x, lemon wit, y, lemon weight, plus geom point, that's fine, geom smooth method, lm formula, x is a function of y, standard error, false color, red, that's fine, unless you want to change it, if you want to make it like green, I like green, that's cool, <laughs> then add a green regression line. Label, X label, instead of length, we're going to say it's width. It's width in millimeters. And Y label is weight. Scatter plot with linear regression, that's fine. Theme minimal, that should all work. And then remember that we were, we called this plot two, so we need to change this to plot two and plot two here. Two places. You got to change this to plot two here and change this to plot two here. And then say labs, labels, subtitle, paste, slope, round, coefficient. See where it says LM1? You need to change that to LM2. And then down here, intercept, round, coefficient, LM1, change that to LM2. And then on to the next line, R squared, round, summary. LM2. Run that. And now you're going to save all that into your plot2 object. And then you want to print that. It's going to look exactly the same if you use this command. So what do you got to do? Change this to say plot2. Now, I hope this is going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Now we've got our lemon width and weight. And we can see that our R squared is 0 0.93. 
Our slope is 3.35. The intercept is negative 94. That's just what we got from the output before, right? Right? I think so. <laughs> Good. And I, I like the green line. I think that looks cool. Nice graph. So write your conclusions. Do we accept or reject our null hypothesis? Did we answer our original question? I will leave this for you to write. Write this down. Think about what was our original question. We were trying to talk about like lemons, right? We're talking about lemons. Like, can we figure out when we buy a lemon and we look at the size, how much juice is going to be in there? Yeah. Actually, there's a pretty strong relationship between size and weight, which we can assume has to do with the amount of juice. So, yeah, that's a really good, strong, linear relationship. And in fact, a little bit of evidence that as they get bigger, they've got even more juice. Although we should really get a lot more data before we say that. The next thing we're going to do is to use this regression equation to predict the weight of a lemon with a length of 100 millimeters. And here's how we can do it. LM1, remember LM1 had all this stuff in it? It was a list with all this stuff. We can refer to the things inside that list using the dollar sign, just like we use the dollar sign to refer to columns inside our data frame. A little different, but same idea. So we'll let, let's say, hey, R, look inside that linear model one object that has the results of our linear regression for lemon length and width. And look inside that coefficients list and take out the first item from there. And that will give us the intercept. Mm -hmm. Right? It pulls it out. That It'll pull out that one thing from the results so that we can use it. We, we did that before in the graphs. Now I'm just kind of breaking it down step by step. Now let's look at that linear model one coefficient and give us the second thing. What's that? That's our slope, right? We pulled out the slope. Now we can use those things and the regression equation to predict the weight of a lemon with a length of 100 millimeters. All we have to do is remember y equals mx plus b or ax plus b. You can change the letters of those, but something x plus b. So it's going to be our 100 millimeter lemon. Oh, it doesn't like it when you use numbers. Lemon 100, <laughs> right? Our lemon 100 is going to be equal to the slope, right, which is this. Might as well just store it as intercept, intercept one and slope one, right, for our first regression. Let's run these and then we'll store them in the objects and that'll be easier to pop them in. Lemon of 100 millimeters is equal to the slope times our x here, 100, plus our intercept. There's our intercept, right? And what do we get? The predicted weight of a lemon that is 100 millimeters long, which is about 10 centimeters, so about like this much. I've measured it before. It's like from my tip of my middle finger to the line across the middle of my palm. So it's like that. That would be a big lemon. That's a big lemon. But they do exist. The predicted weight would be 239 grams. Nice. That's going to make plenty of lemonade. Based on our regression equation, if we have a lemon of length 100 millimeters, how much do we predict it will weigh? We 
we predict a lemon of 100 millimeters length will weigh 239 grams. We could also calculate a standard deviation for that, but that's fine. Cool, right? Now, let's say we had a lemon that had a width of 10 millimeters, so one centimeter. It's tiny. Lemon. We had a tiny lemon. How much is it going to weigh? Are we going to get any juice out of that at all? I don't know. Let's try it and find out. So we can use the same code from this chunk above. I think this is easy to just copy this and paste it below. Or you can try typing it out anew. You can say intercept, intercept two is going to be equal to LM2, linear model two. That's where we did the width regression, remember? LM2 dollar sign coefficients, it pops up for you, square bracket one. That gives us our intercept from our second model, negative 94. Then we can say slope two. Let's store this in something called slope two is from LM2 dollar sign coefficients square brackets two. That gives us the slope from our second linear model, which is 3.35, right? Then we just have to do our prediction. We can say lemon, our lemon that is a width of 10 will be y, that's our y, equals m. What's our m? Our slope to times x, our x here is 10 for 10 millimeters, right? Plus b, our b is our intercept, intercept 2, so intercept 2 from the second equation. Run that, and then to see lemon 10, we run it all by itself, and here we get we get a negative number, which actually isn't surprising. <laughs> it isn't surprising. So based on our regression equation, if we have a lemon of width 10 millimeters, how much do we predict it will weigh? We predict it will weigh negative 60.5 grams, which is impossible. Hmm. Okay. Why? Why do we get something like that? So let's consider a summary of our data. We did this before, but let's look at it again. Our minimum, our maximum length for the lemons was 58, and we tried to predict a lemon of length 100. Our minimum width for a lemon was 30. That's our data range, and we tried to predict the weight of a lemon of 10. We went way outside our data range. Are these results reliable? Are these predictions valid? Hmm, probably not. Remember the term extrapolation, how we talked about making predictions outside the range of your data, that, that's extrapolating? It's very tempting to do that. And of course, you probably see it all the time. People are always trying to predict the future, what's happening, what's gonna happen that's never happened before. Maybe it'll work. Maybe not. The, the past does not always predict the future. The current data range we have may or may not well predict the data that we're going to get in the future. If we had an intercept of zero, like if we had set that intercept to zero, Right. If we had if we had actually done our regression where we had set our intercept to zero and we would just say that slope times ten, then we'd actually be predict predicting a, a weight of thirty three grams, which would still be wrong. <laughs> Although I guess if we had set our intercept to zero, it would change the slope too. Yeah. So extrapolating outside 
of the range of the data is a general no-no. So why might the above predictions be unreliable? The above predictions are unreliable because we are ex extrapolating well outside the range of our data. That's all you need to say. You can also say something about the fact that our intercepts don't make any sense. <laughs> what other questions can we ask about lemons using regression? I will leave this up to you. It's, this has been a very long video already. And thank you so much for sticking with it. And I really hope that this helps you in everything you wish to do throughout your entire life. Okay.